also listed on your program. Thank you. This forum will begin shortly. Good evening, everyone. My name is David Elwood, and I want to welcome you here to the John F. Kennedy Jr. Forum at the Harvard Kennedy School. This is a really special evening for us tonight um, because we have with us someone who is here to talk about one of the few bright spots that came from what we once called the Arab Spring and was is in a position to help us think m as effectively as anyone can is how we can really make these things and this thing we call democracy work. We ha I, tonight, we have with us <coughs> the Honorable Mady Joma. <laughs> I'd like to acknowledge several distinguished guests uh, here in the audience. His Excellency's wife, Hala Joma, uh, right here. Former ministry, uh, former minister of um, uh, infrastructure, Mr. Larvey, <laughs> and the former minister of higher education, scientific research, and information and communication technologies, Dr. Jalasi. <laughs> Let me also thank the Institute of Politics here, as well as the Belfer Center for Science and International Affairs, our Mosavran Romani Center for Business and Government and the Office of the University Marshal for all their work in putting this together. In 2011, um, when a street merchant uh, set himself afire in January of 2011, a remarkable set of events uh, began to transpire, starting in Tunisia, but quickly spreading across North Africa and other places. Um, we saw a remarkable transformation. Governments began to fall, people, uh, were desperately trying and seeking to have revolutions that would result in free elections and the like. But one by one, many of these things have not turned out quite the way the original organizers had hoped. Tunisia seems, uh, though fragile, a bright spot. And it's really fascinating to understand the story. Um, we can hear, we'll hear more about this, but it's not that in Tunisia things were always easy or went really well from the start. Um, this was a period when, yes, there were elections, but they were highly contested. Then there was two assa several assassinations of leftist uh, uh, political leaders. And there were very many times, there was big, there were calls for a, a, a government uh, governed by Sharia law. So there are many times when this experiment felt like it could have gone the, the same way that some of the others have. Um, but a variety of people came together and began to think about ways to make it really work. In um, our speaker tonight in 2011 was uh, working in France as he had been for most of 25 years, 24 years. He specialized, his, he was in the company, the Total Group, where he specialized in aeronautical systems and worked on several programs dealing in defense and aerospace. Yet, um, in, uh, he was called upon uh, in 2011 or 2012 to be the Minister of Industry, right? Uh, 2012. 2012, um, after several uh, challenges periods. Uh, 2013, I'm sorry, 2013. 2013. Um, and he, though his family was in politics, this is something that wouldn't necessarily, I think, have occurred to you, but this was a chance to come back and work for your country. He became Minister of a Industry, um, and he brought together a new energy strategy, uh, an increasing mix of renewable and high-value-added industrial policy. Uh, he, ra he rationalized energy subsidies um, and culture change and social responsibility in large industrial groups in Tunisia. Then after, later in uh, 23rd, early in 2013, uh, when the, the country was thrown into crisis, he again was quite involved in putting the pieces together. And in January 2014, after several months of acute political crisis, which stalled the transition process, he was selected by the National Dialogue Committee to become the head of government, 
and to serve as the interim prime minister until the next election. He was, in char he was charged with completing the transition process with the ultimate objective of organizing the country's first general elections under the new constitution. During his tenure in office, he restructured and enhanced uh, the security, security apparatus to deal with terrorism. He launched a national economic dialogue to build a national consensus around priority fiscal and structural reforms, organized a major investment conference entitled Invest in Tunisia. He introduced an innovative governance procedure based on a trilogy of vision, strategy, and leadership. And in December of 2014, the first truly free and fair presidential election since 1956 happened in Tunisia, and he is no longer the prime minister as of February 6th. It is exactly what many reformers might have dreamed of. Not surprisingly, he's gotten the Tunisian Order of Republic, the German Order of Merit, um, and the Amadeus Man of the Year distinction from Morocco. Interestingly enough, uh, just in my chatting with him uh, earlier on, he talked also about his strategy for how he thought about governing during that period. I hope you'll talk some about that, and if you don't, I will ask you a question or two because it's a fascinating and very uncommon strategy that uh, he proposed. So please join me in welcoming the Honorable Meda Joma. Thank you, dear Dean, for this uh, nice and uh, uh, bright uh, introduction. Uh, thank you, dear uh, uh, faculty officials and uh, students, uh, and dear guests. Uh, to all of you, uh, good evening. Uh, it's a real pleasure uh, for me uh, to be here today in Harvard. Finally, I would say, because uh, I was used to, uh, to come to Boston I think uh, more than uh, 15 times, and each time uh, I was uh, intending to visit Harvard, but never happening. Uh, and now I am here in Harvard, but not visiting the business school as a businessman, but the Kennedy School uh, of Governance as a politician. So I'm really happy to be with you. And uh, I thank you for uh, hosting me and giving me the opportunity to speak about uh, our experience, about our nice country, about what I call the startup democracy. Uh, I think uh, I was wondering uh, which could interest such uh, uh, skilled and uh, famous uh, people and famous uh, instant. And I remind the question of uh, the President uh, Obama when uh, I, I have been here in the United States in a state visit. Uh, he told me what makes Tunisia succeeding in uh, the transition uh, process. So I will try to develop that. And uh, maybe after, uh, we'll try to forecast, forecast the future, uh, how to consolidate this experience how, how and then how can uh, be benefit for the whole uh, region. And uh, since uh, Dean asked me to do that, maybe I will speak about the way to set up uh, this government to manage this uh, uh, difficult and turbulent period. So it's another way, another style to make politics, another style to, uh, to be in the government. I will t tell you about that. So. First, let's, let's, let's start with the beginning. You know, uh, uh, early in January 2011, uh, uh, an earthquake began in Tunisia and then uh, propagated in all the region, a revolution, uh, and uh, the emergency of uh, this transition uh, period, turbulent transition uh, period. Uh, to remind things, this revolution occurred because uh, there was a uh, uh, an expectation mainly from uh, young people, connected people, because the tool of the revolution was mainly Facebook, internet, since uh, there was no freedom in the expression and in the media, so people used the modern 
uh, modern means to uh, to do uh, their uh, their uh, their revolution, and uh, we can summarize the expectation in three main things: freedom, of course, but as well looking for opportunities since we have educated, graduated people, skilled people, and the economy was not able to generate enough opportunity, enough job for them. So they are uh, looking for that, and uh, then as well. Uh, it was uh, because there is a problem in Tunisia of uh, imbalanced development between the inner land and the coast lands. So problem, f freedom, uh, opportunities, and development. After, it was not so easy. I think at that time, uh, it was like a dream. Uh, we succeeded to make the revolution within four weeks. Fantastic some victims uh, even one victim is a lot but compared what we know in the history and in geography it's reduced the price that we paid and the dream uh, was that uh, since we succeeded the revolution we will succeed quickly to solve all the problems but we forget then in a revolution you make the problems more complex because you are uh, you need to reconstruct and you shake, you, uh, you shake the state, you shake the structure, the existing structure, and that's what happens. And even though uh, there is another problem that uh, the political class was not prepared to take the place of the previous regime. And uh, the only thing uh, where, they uh, where they prepared is the human rights exercise because they, are, they were in the opposition, they were, they were really struggling for human rights, but after when they came to the state, manage the state is more complex. You need that, you need the, the human rights, but you need to manage, you need to check problems, you need social, you need economy, you need finance, you need all of that, and they did, they did not have the opportunity to do. So it was a really complex, a uh, lot of crisis, security crisis as well, since uh, there was a, a problem with the security staff, it was seen as the tool of the repression of the previous regime and as well all what is happening, what happened in, uh, in the area uh, with the revolution in Libya uh, and in other countries which has a big impact on the security in Tunisia. Uh, for the first time we see the terrorism happening in Tunisia, we were not used with that. It's really strange for us, strange phenomena. Uh, it was linked with what happened, uh, happened uh, in, the, in the region. So, social protestation, uh, political lack, political crisis, security crisis, a lot of things to solve S uh, in the meantime. And you have the young people who made the revolution were expecting to solve the original problem, which is a job, jobless, and uh, opportunities and economic and uh, de development. So that was the story. I think uh, you know uh, some uh, details, and uh, let's say that uh, uh, we all the uh, all the Tunisian were shocked by the first uh, political assassination, and then the second, and we consumed uh, I think four govern four government within three years. So it was uh, it was a lot, but it gives an idea about the instability that uh, we live, and. Uh, at that time, there was a big pressure on the political class to stop fighting and uh, to gather themselves, to stay around the table and to lead a dialogue. It was done because we have a strong civil society and among them, women, which are stronger again and really present and they exerted a big pressure on the political class to say, stop now, you have to find a solution to this issue. We did not make this revolution to get more trouble. We made this revolution to, to get a progress. And uh, I think we made the progress through this approach, approach of dialogue, approach of compromise, but as well inclusive approach. All the different parties, whatever their ideology, whatever uh, they are coming from the right or from the left. They stayed around the table and they found a solution. And uh, we succeeded 
to uh, vote and to adopt a constitution. We are proud of this constitu constitution. We can tell you that with you, with everywhere, with all the free people in the world, we are sharing the same value like freedom, freedom of belief, freedom of thinking, freedom of expression, all these nice values that all the people are sharing or intending to share, and you have it. We have a secular constitution today, which was agreed by all the parties, whatever their reference, even the religious reference, and that's the frame of all the political exercise and future in Tunisia today. And we don't see people, uh, we don't see their origin, we don't see their ideology. They are free to believe on what they want to free, but we see them through the respect of the constitution and of the law. And that's the most important thing happening in Tunisia. So after the, there was the election to prepare and uh, the dialogue pointed this government, I was in charge of this government with the main uh, priority, which is to lead uh, the last stage or the last step of this transition with successful, transparent and fair uh, elections. And hopefully we succeeded to do that. But to do that, it was important to offer the right environment, political appeasement. We were living a big crisis and we had to manage that. And we are supposed to be non-political. But we were aware that that period was extremely political. So, but we brought our style, a new style to manage politics. And uh, when I hired uh, the ministers and uh, all the government, uh, uh, government team, uh, there was a commitment not to belong to any party and to respect that till the end of the mission and they did. And it was <coughs> important because the first thing to uh, to do, it was to keep the same distance from each party, and they are numbers, but a positive distance. I mean, not to break with them, but to be open to them, but without any uh, influence, and I think that we succeeded, and that's why we gave to the scene, to the landscape, we gave them the appeasement that we need. We checked as well the security problem, the terrorism, which were not uh, a tradition in our country, but with the lack of equipment, but we worked on the motivation and in the restore, restore, restoring the, the confidence, restoring the, 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 the trust between the population and the security staff and the trust of the security staff themselves. And like in any group, the first thing is not the equipment, but the motivation. And we restored the motivation, and then we worked on the organization and coordination. And in that way, we gained the first, uh, uh, the first fight against the tourism. And we can tell you that today, Tunisia is safer. Uh, when we started, we are reacting to the threats. Now we are anticipating all their operation, all uh, their plans, and we have a good, a good success on that. What we have to do now is to protect, uh, protect our house from the out, outside uh, threats coming from the region, and you know how trouble is the region, but I do believe uh, in the capability of the Tunisian state, of the Tunisian people to, uh, to, uh, to do that, to succeed in that, because uh, the population now is on the side uh, of uh, the security side uh, fighting all together against this phenomena. They took advantage from the weakness of the state of the, re the revolution uh, to recruit some of the people that they sent outside to recruit some of the people. But now, uh, since we have uh, a good collaboration with the population, I think that's the best protection. It's more important than helicopters and other means. We need equipments, but the most important is we need the support of the population, and that's what we have. And we recover our tradition, 
uh, of peace, of rejecting violence in Tunisia. And believe me, that's uh, inherited from 3,000 years of history in Tunisia of tolerance, openness, and uh, open, uh, open uh, minds. Uh, now, I think uh, maybe about the factor of success. I told you this history, this uh, tradition of moderation, this tradition of tolerance, of compromise, of dialogue, uh, the strength of, uh, of the civil uh, society, but as, as well the level of education, which is important. In Tunisia, we choose since the first year of independence to invest in education. Third of the budget was invested in education and only few percent in military staff. That's the truth. And we realize today how, uh, how important it is. And we think that uh, among the reforms for the future is to reform the education to improve it because it was successful in the past, but we have to continue. That's the best way to protect our society and to put it on the track of, uh, of uh, the, the, the progress. Uh, I think that's the main, the main thing is that, uh, that, uh, that we have. I think we succeeded as well uh, in this transition because we have a clear commitment. We have a roadmap which was written in clear terms and we committed to respect, respect this roadmap in the content and in the schedule as well, in the deadlines. We committed and we shared with all the people this target and we worked only on this target and we were clear and we reached this tar target and it was one of the key success that means any commitment, any contract should be clear and shared. And when you share things, even though they need sacrifice, they need efforts, people are willing to do that and that's the experience we have today in Tunisia. What's about the future? I think that we did not finish the transition. We finished the political transition. Uh, we have a constitution, we have now elected parliament, we have a government uh, coming, emerging from this elected parliament, we have elected the president, we have all the institution now, uh, which were elected in a fair and, uh, and in a fair and transparent way, but we have to pay attention to that. It's young, they, they need to be consolidated, so it's still fragile, and uh, we don't have to make the mistake to say it's already well done, no, we have to pay attention to that. But the most important challenge for the future is to start the economic transition. I told you the aim of the revolution, freedom. Okay, we answered with the political transition. And now we have freedom, it needs to be improved, it needs to be consolidated, but we did not answer the expectation of the young people of job, employment, development. And that's why we have really to focus on the economic and, uh, and social uh, uh, transition, which is important, uh, important as well to ensure the sustainability of our political system of our young democracy and for that I think we need reforms uh, if uh, there was a revolution that means that uh, the model was not the best one anyhow it's not no more at least uh, the, the, the best one and uh, with my government it was not in our commitment in our roadmap but when we made the judgment stick we decided to start the reforms, and we started some of the economic reforms, which was not easy, and, uh, but the people accepted. We started for the subsidies, energy subsidies, we started it. For the fiscality, we started some fiscality reforms. We started the reforms of the bank, the sector, the, the, the public uh, so the banking system. system. And there is many other reforms that we have really to push as quick as possible to have the courage to do that because we need that for the future. We have to see Tunisia in the future and that's why we, t we drafted a vision that we presented uh, in a conference of for investment in September that we called with the participation of many countries and all uh, the main uh, financial institutions. And in this vision, 
we gave a project for the country because we need that project to ask people to give more to the country, to, to give more sacrifice, to work more, harder. And, uh, but it's a promising. We know that in Tunisia we have a big potential and we have the means, we have the resources. Well, you know, Tunisia has its geography and its history. When you see Tunisia, it's in a cross point of three big areas. We are building, belonging to Africa. We are in the North Africa. And you know how potential, how is the potentiality of Africa? We are in the Arabic countries. We are part of natural, uh, our natural environment is there. But as well, we are open to Europe. When you know that 80% of our trade today is made uh, with Europe, you know how, how big the knowledge and the know-how we have to, to deal with European. And so we could be a platform, we could be a hub for the future. We have the resources open, we speak languages, we have everything to succeed, we don't need oil. We need just to invest in our resources, to believe in our future, and we have the means to succeed, but we have to sacrifice to work harder than we were used for a couple uh, of years. I think if we succeed that, we can say that we are in the right track in, in Tunisia, and uh, that we will comply uh, really fully with the aspiration of our young people, we will comply of, uh, with uh, our bright uh, history, uh, and we can give a hope to the whole region, and you know the trouble in the region today, uh, I was asked uh, in some interviews whether we are a model. I don't like to say that we are a model. We will not be a model, but an example and mainly a hope. We have, we Tunisian, the responsibility to succeed for our country, Tunisia. But we have the responsibility as well to succeed for all the region, for the young people, for their aspiration. You with us, we with you, we have the common responsibility to make this experience succeeding because it's important for the region, it's important for the peace in the world, it's important for the prosperity. And uh, I like to say that uh, Tunisia, it's like a startup. It's a small today, it's risky, but it has a big leverage. A leverage on prosperity, a leverage on democracy, a leverage on the peace, so I invite all of you to believe in it, to bet in it, and to invest in it. Thank you. <laughs> we now have time for questions. There are four microphones located, one here, one up here, one right here, and one right here. And I'd like to remind all those in our audience about what a good question looks like here at the Kennedy School. And that is you begin by identifying yourself, you keep it short, it has but one thought, and it ends with a question mark. Uh, so with that, uh, let me actually uh, ask you a quick question to begin with and then turn it over. Um, when you became prime minister, you'd run and you know you'd been involved in aerospace. You'd done crisis management. So forth. How did you select your cabinet? So I, I will tell you the story. When uh, you, we hire a prime minister in general, he's coming from uh, a party. He has a structure. He has a staff. I was selected. I was by my own in my flat. Even my family was living in Paris, and I was wondering how to do. So I started by the beginning. I put a strategy and a criteria to select them. I was aware since uh, I was uh, Minister of Industry and living the crisis, how uh, complex things are. And my, uh, my, uh, my, my most important thing or uh, uh, that uh, I can rely on is the team that I will select and not the party uh, or any other organization. So it was important to do that. Uh, so I defined the profiles. Uh, it's limited team. I reduced the number of ministers. I reduced the number of advisors. The advisors in the previous government were, I think they were around something like 25 and I reduced them to four. It's like a commanders, to tell you. A commanders team, 
but to select the best. And I selected them uh, everywhere in the world. One of the criteria, I uh, refused to select and to choose anyone that I knew before. All my ministers were unknown. And it's uh, a different way to do politics, to organize things. I was used to that. I know that it's hard and I have to build everything from the ground. And to establish a commitment, an agreement, a contract with them, and the contract was easy. I will tell you the content of the contract. I tell them, we are in a big issue. We have a big responsibility. Uh, you will stop earning money. You will join the team. You will work hard. You will not be thanked. Maybe you will s receive some bits. You are forbidden to resign. You are forbidden to quit the ship. You have to continue till the last day. And no one is allowed to resign. And that's the contract. That's what I promised to them, and they accepted. And uh, what is important in the profiles is uh, for each department uh, to, to check that they have the skills and the experience. Second, the personality, and then the capability to manage resources, to manage people, problems, and money, uh, which is uh, not a common in, uh, in, in the choice of the government. And after I selected many, more than I need, and after the most important thing is how to set up this assembly of the team and to make a consistent team. Because I know that's my square, where I have to, 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 to be strong and to face all the problems. So it's objective things, and I, uh, as well, I selected people who can resist the crisis, because I was aware that it's a chain uh, of, uh, of crisis that we will uh, encounter. So it was completely another way to make uh, uh, another style of governance, another uh, way uh, to make politics. We were said apolitics, uh, apolitical. We were not politicians, but uh, let's say that we made politics in a different way. Great, thank you. Right here. Thank you, Prime Minister Joma. My name is Daniel. I'm a first year student here at the Kennedy School. Uh, my question is this. What was it that set Tunisia apart from the other failed revolutions like in Libya or in Egypt that Tunisia was able to discover democracy and a secular government? I, I think the main factor is the history of Tunisia. So maybe I forget something which is important. I, I, uh, in Tunisia, we have, uh, we have the, the tradition of uh, law and state. Uh, you know that the first draft of the constitution goes back to 18, uh, 1852. So it's not new. Uh, and the second thing, we have uh, uh, a strong uh, notion of, uh, of the state. Uh, and uh, even during the revolution, we did not uh, break uh, the state. We shaked it, but we, we, we break the regime and kept the state. I think that these two major things are important, and that's our refuge, the law we have. We are used with law, we are used with constitution, it was like, uh, let's say, an incremental improvement. And uh, the, the, the notion of the state was very strong with Tunisian. Besides, all what I said, the, society, uh, the civil society, they are uh, willing to, uh, the, to the compromise, to the discussion, to the dialogue, uh, the women, the education. Uh, and I think we found, we share with all our, our neighbors some of that, uh, that uh, values that uh, specificity, but in the meantime, we have our own as well. Thank you. Thank you very much. Right up here. Uh, Jay Gleason. Um, Tunisia has had close relations with Palestine for many decades. Uh, the last two presidents, Ghanoucci and Mazurki, uh, had very cordial relations with the democratically elected government of Hamas, but the new president seems to be much more critical of the Islamists. Uh, what do you feel will be the relation uh, in the near future of Tunisia with uh, Palestine, uh, the divided Palestinian leadership? And uh, also, what do you think the international community should be doing in the face of the rapid expansion of the settlements uh, in the occupied territories? Uh, 
Yeah. Uh, okay, I think in Tunisia we have uh, our many traditions. Among them, we have uh, a diplomatic tradition. And our reference is uh, the international community and the international law. So uh, we, we keep that. With our relation, uh, we have relation not with organizations, but we have relation with states. And uh, so even though uh, sometimes because we were in a, in a transition period, there was uh, some position which are compliant with the the, the fundamental orientation of the diplomacy of Tunisia since a couple of decades. It's uh, due to this uh, instability, but today uh, we have the same line that we got before, and uh, our relations are very clear uh, for, the, for the Palestine. We, uh, we, uh, we, we support uh, uh, the, the independence, we support the independence through the dialogue and through the international law and institution. Right up here. Thank you. Uh, my name is Iman Masmoudi. I'm a freshman in the college. Uh, I wanted to ask, you mentioned investment, and I wanted to ask uh, where or what should Tunisia prioritize when it seeks loans or funding from outside states? So you talked about a lack of equipment for security purposes. Are there specific industries or markets that you would prioritize uh, when seeking out outside investment? Uh, so first, uh, Tunisia, uh, when you see uh, Tunisia was used, it's an open uh, investment land. Half of the companies in Tunisia uh, are uh, uh, outside of foreign investment or partly or entirely. And uh, since uh, the revolution, there was uh, uh, a decrease of the investment due to the lack of vision and the instability, which is normal. But now, uh, with the, the stability, with the with the with the stability and the visibility that we will give, uh, I think that uh, we will uh, uh, drain more and more investment. Uh, so, with regard to the law and to uh, landscape, uh, I, I mean the, the environment of investment. It's known we have uh, many companies, uh, uh, and the, the biggest investment is made by French, German, uh, Italian companies. Uh, in the vision that we presented in September, we, de we, we, we defined uh, the priority or the potential sectors where we have to invest. To summarize that, what is important in Tunisia now to give job to educated people is the added value. And to make all our industry and e economy, uh, to make its evolution with more added value. And uh, you see like ICT, we have, um, good engineer there, we have, we have th that, and uh, uh, it's easy to export. And uh, we have many companies now that we can build all around big things. And I think that's one of the major sectors where we have uh, so telecommunication, uh, uh, internet services, but healthcare as well, agro-food. Uh, we are the first, already the first, uh, first exporter of industrial goods from the south to the north of Mediterranean. It's not known. We know Tunisia uh, more about tourism, which is important. But uh, if you take only automotive, it's close in terms of GDP, uh, GDP to, the, to the tourism. Aerospace industry, which uh, we have a good basis now of aerospace industry. Uh, we have all these sectors are defined and I think what is important again in Tunisia, it's not the Tunisian market, but the availability of skilled and qualified resources. Our uh, position as a platform, as a hub for these three big area where we have a good knowledge to work with them. And I think for all the foreign, uh, for all the foreign um, uh, investor today, they are seeing Tunisia as an opportunity for the whole area. Very good, right over here. Thank you, my name is Wright. I'm a sophomore at the college and a research assistant at the Belfer Center. So several thousand Tunisians have gone overseas to join the Islamic State. And I was wondering if you could comment on what might be the motivating factors causing so many Tunisians to join the Islamic State? How can those be addressed? And how will the country respond when these radicalized fighters return? Okay, you know, 
I think there is a natural coalition against uh, the terrorism, anywhere, any shape, any form, it is. Uh, and we realized how dangerous uh, it is for all our societies and uh, how global it becomes today as a threat and the answer should be global. So we have good collaboration with all the countries, neighbor countries, but all the countries, among them United States, uh, we are facing uh, the same threat and really uh, we are aware and there is a lot of trust and confidence facing that. So we have the responsibility to face that because we don't believe in any system offering only violence to the people. I never seen any in their speech, any, any uh, proposal to solve the problem of uh, poverty, the problem of healthcare, or uh, it's just the blood and we cannot agree. We can agree all of us to uh, face that. And uh, the coalition, whether it's uh, technical, military or other, I think it includes all the free people in the world and all the people who are aspiring to nice uh, future for uh, their, their, their people. About uh, the fighters, the Tunisian fighters, what uh, I, uh, I, you know, after the revolution, there was the weakness of the state, a lack of security, a lack of security because, uh, uh, as I told you, the staff of the security was seen as a part of the regime. And these groups took advantage from that. And they recruit people. They come and they recruit people. Some of them stayed in Tunisia. Some of them uh, immigrated to this, uh, to, to, to the Middle East area to fight. But what I can tell you that we stopped that. It was really covered. We restored the security and we restored the control of our boundaries. And those who were recruited, they are now under stress and reduced. And I told you that the population now is in this fighting against the terrorism. But those who uh, immigrated to Syria and Iraq were not in the same environment. The environment in, Tun in Tunisia is helping uh, to cancel this problem, to, to fight this problem. The environment there is to develop. But we stop it. There is no more flu of combatant. It's that was like that, uh, uh, the, the revolution. Uh, a lack of security and they took advantage, but we stopped that. In Tunisia, it's safer. And we are uh, really uh, working hardly and in open way with all the countries now. It was in the region, but now it's worldwide uh, how to deal with the fighters coming back. And it's not a Tunisian problem today, it's a worldwide problem. Right over there. Thank you very much. <coughs> uh, my name is Bassam Sua. I'm a Tunisian, and I'm here for a short program in the Kennedy uh, School of Governance. Uh, so uh, my question is to, uh, first of all, I, I would like to admit that you came in a, a critical uh, situation where the country was in a difficult situation, and your job is to manage the, the country uh, in a crisis. And I think you did well, and uh, based on the priorities you, uh, you set, I mean, mainly the security and uh, uh, the, the, the transition, the peaceful transition. But now I think we need to think about the future, the way forward. And I want to take two key words that you mentioned in your presentation, in your speech. Uh, you mentioned reform, I think, th two or three times, and also you mentioned education. And I, th I think this is the way forward. But my concern is that probably some people may say that maybe the current political situation in the country maybe doesn't allow to go for such kind of reforms. Because you know reforms in education, this is a costly thing. And politicians mainly are concerned by short, uh, I mean, they have short period, like three or four years or five years, and they're concerned by the next elections. So can they sustain the pressure from the for labor union, from the civil society, to do a kind of long-term uh, uh, projects? And this is, this is, this kind of projects, they need kind of leader with a vision, and the leader with a vision for a short period of time, uh, I think this is also something difficult. So I want to, uh, ask for your, uh, 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 I, uh, how do you think about this? <laughs> I, I think I will answer in uh, an easy way. If you don't have the, ca the, the courage to do, it's never enough. You, don't, you, you never have enough time to do. 
And uh, what you delay to do today, to today you will uh, lose uh, time. I think that we have to start now. Uh, three or four years or five years or ten years. You know, the reforms that we started during the year, the, 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 these reforms were not for our government period. The reforms are for the future. So, and we are in a new system now. We are in a system where the government could um, take place for five years, but for five months. And we cannot each time say, we cannot do the reforms, we have to delay, we have to, to put it now. We have to take the courage and to do it right now and to start it right now. And uh, if we don't do that, we will do it later, but uh, harder and uh, with less possibility, with less margin to do it in the right way. So I do believe that we do. We have the obligation to have the courage to start. Right up here. Hi, I'm Aman Rizvi, a student at the college. And I worked in Tunisia last summer, and I often found that um, in the interior of the country, places like um, al kaf um, Qarwan, Gafsa, um, people still felt very much left out and excluded from the rest of the country, both politically and economically, even, though the re even after the, resolution, the revolution that began in Sidi Bouzid. So I was wondering, sort of, what do you think Tunisia needs to do to include the interior and help the interior of the country develop? I think the first uh, thing to do uh, is to be honest with people. And I think the mistake made that we, uh, we promise it to people uh, just after the revolution that we will check their problems as quick as they are expecting, which is not possible. You know, it's, uh, we are speaking about cumulative problems uh, of decades. And uh, whatever we made a revolution or not, you cannot solve these problems within a couple of months. So we have to be clear with the people, to explain to them what we want to do, to give them a project, to give them a vision for the future and to give them the right scale time. Uh, and uh, you know, uh, you, you, we are speaking about uh, the difference between the inland and the coast. And uh, you don't have roads, you don't have high highways, you don't have trains, you don't, you don't. And you have a state which is tired by four uh, years of instability, by four years of uh, uh, political fighting, security issues, and before by two decades of um, bad management. And you think that you have the mean to do what you miss it to do uh, within 30 years, in three months, it's wrong. So that's why we have to start the reforms. We have to give a vision and a project to the country to explain to the people and to give them the right scale. Okay, we have to help them and I, uh, we have the responsibility to help them socially, but uh, we, we are not honest if we can tell them that next year you will have factories, uh, roads and trains. Thank you, right up here. Good afternoon. My name is Deb, and I'm in the mid-career program here. I want to thank you so much by starting out your speech talking about the women. I was amazed that you talked about the role of the women in ushering in this change. I was so inspired. And I'd like to know what you're doing um, to continue to hold hands with these women to make sure that the change continues to go forward on schedule, as, as you had talked about how they were so practical. I, I, I just think, appreciate uh, I think that the women will not let us the choice. They are 60%. <laughs> when you know that they are 60% now of the student at the university, how you can imagine the future of the men? <laughs> I think, no, no. R really, it's, uh, uh, it's again in the tradition of the Tunisian society. And we got the chance after the independence to, uh, with the president, uh, Bourguiba, to make something which is uh, a real revolution. Is to, uh, to, to put as an obligation the education of all the children, women, and uh, I mean girls and, uh, and uh, boys. And uh, now when you see the situation of the men, they are everywhere in the, all the activities. Uh, they are uh, 
in the agriculture activities, but they are in the government, they are uh, as pilot, they are uh, as police, as, uh, and uh, we are in this big trend because we invested in that during the last 50, uh, 50 years. So, and uh, really, uh, that's the statistics today. Uh, they are 60% in the university, 60% of women, 40% of men. So I think that the future is promising. Right here. Hi, my name is Mitchell Alva. I'm a master's student here at the Kennedy School. You spoke a lot about desperately needed economic reforms in the banking sector, subsi energy subsidies, but I want to ask you about the informal economy. Um, by some estimates, informal economy comprises 30 to 35 to 40 percent of Tunisia's GDP output, and these are activities that take place outside the scope of the legal structure. Mohamed Bouazizi was a street a, a fruit vendor, a street vendor. He was an informal sector worker. What reforms are necessary to extend social protections, raise wages for these low-wage workers that comprise such a large portion of Tunisia's economy and are so central to the aspirations of the revolution? Yeah, I think it's an important thing. So there is two kinds of formal economy. Uh, there is the formal economy when you speak about Boazizi, uh, that's a small, uh, small jobs and, uh, and formal. And uh, I think with the progress and when the state and the government has the mean, we have to enlarge the protection and we have some programs for that to include some people uh, with the social protection. We have now, uh, they have all of them, they have uh, health care protection, all of them, uh, whatever. And I think with the progress, we can uh, enlarge the, co uh, the, 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 the coverage. But there is the other, which is uh, like, uh, for me, criminal, uh, a criminal uh, parallel e economy which grow, grows a lot after the revolution since this lack of security, since this lack of control of the borders. And we started, and we started really uh, um, pushing that. Uh, we started, uh, uh, it, it will be, it will take some time because you cannot check and solve the issues uh, in one day, uh, but with our government, uh, among the vision of the control of the of the boundaries of the borders is as well to uh, to fight this uh, this phenomena with the big fishes and not uh, the small uh, the small guys i think we have to uh, to uh, emphasize on that and for the others it depends on the growth we will have in the economy and the means of the state but the trend is really to integrate them and to give them the minimum of coverage and the minimum that they have today is uh, the health care. Right here. Uh, I'm Nizar Beneji from Tunisia. I'm a visiting scholar at the Massachusetts, Massachusetts University of Amherst. So my question is, uh, we have many uh, Tunisian experts in many countries around the world. So how can we encourage them to come back and to, uh, to contribute in this transition and to make this startup a success? And uh, we, let's say we, ca we succeeded politically, but we have to follow, uh, we have to succeed in other domains. Thank you. I told you already my way to, to recruit these people uh, through the world, uh, to ask them to work hard, not to, uh, to, to earn money. Uh, I think that you have a responsibility, all of you. Uh, if you are uh, expecting uh, the paradise and to prepare a comfortable place for you, it will be difficult. But if you feel that you are a part and you have a responsibility, you have to go back, even for a mission. And I think there is uh, enough space to act. That was my case. That was the case of uh, half of my team. All of them have good position, a bright career. Uh, you have both, uh, you have two here. One he was teaching uh, uh, in, uh, in managing uh, Doyen, I have to say, um, been in, 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 in a famous school in Paris, teaching in the United States. When I called him, he was in the United States. The second was living uh, in Washington, working for the World Bank, and uh, they made the choice to come, not to earn money or to have a comfortable, no, the, they chose to, uh, to come and to, to live in a crisis uh, atmosphere. And uh, I think it's uh, exciting. It's another source of motivation. Right up here. Hi. Um, my name is Casey Gallagher-Schmitz, and I'm a sophomore at the college. My question is in regards to Tunisia's role in the African Union 
And uh, going forward, what do you think your country's role should be in helping to promote government reform and economic reform in the other members of the African Union? We are so far from the African Union or any union, and I don't believe that it's uh, a political decision to do that. Um, uh, when you see uh, how unions are built, I think that if each component of this uh, uh, space uh, work to progress in the reforms in the democracy, it will be a natural way to have more common interests, uh, more interferences, and it will be built step by step by naturally. I don't think that we are able today to force the destiny by a political decision, all the experience that tried in that way failed. Right up here, there'll be time just for two more questions. Great. Hi, uh, my name is Laura Thompson. I'm a doctoral student here, um, and I've been studying Tunisia for a very long time, so it's a great pleasure to be able to hear you speak. Um, I wanted to ask specifically about the um, notion of freedom of religion that you, as you mentioned, is guaranteed by the Constitution. Um, and I'm particularly interested in the, uh, the great number, the unprecedented number of cases in the post-Arab Spring moment of Tunisians who were uh, prosecuted um, for public order offenses uh, for attacking the sacred. Um, so specifically we have, for example, the very famous case of the Mahdiya atheist. Um, cool. The Mahdiya atheist, um, Ghazi Beji and Jabir Mejri. Les athées Les athées qui ont... Les athées de Mahdi, Tunis. No, I, I would prefer that you say, you said les athées before I leave the government because... Ah, <laughs> uh, blogueur athée Ah, yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, okay. <laughs> so I'm especially interested then in thinking about what this means for the guarantee of freedom of religion. Is this a, a different type of conception of freedom of religion or is this just perhaps a blip or an exception um, that you don't imagine will be seen again? No, really I believe that it's uh, an exception and uh, you cannot uh, find uh, many other examples and I I it's, uh, it's normal, you know. Uh, four years ago you have uh, all the population in this case. Now if you have one or two cases we have to struggle to avoid that but I think we are in, in progress and in my belief uh, maybe uh, I think that we cannot go back we cannot go back, we can only progress. And that's the role uh, of all of you when there is some cases like that is to put the pressure. But believe me, there is no official intention uh, to go back or uh, uh, to, uh, to exert such, uh, such, uh, such a pressure. You have as well the society and it's not because you change it, the text, you will change. That's why uh, I'm saying that we have to consolidate and when you see, when, when I say consolidate, is to transform the text in the behavior, even the respect of the law. Now, when you work on the street, there is a lot uh, of infraction of the law, and we are making all the system to respect the law, but we know that it needs time to change the behavior of the people that needs time. But the intention, the law, and um, the policy to, to today is really to go ahead and to progress. And that's a way to progress is, uh, not to allow uh, such uh, things without uh, speak about and without protesting. This will be the last question. Uh, thank you so much, Prime Minister. But uh, you made an interview to me. Yes. You have uh, more questions? I have one more you question. You will <laughs> add them to the <laughs> interview. <laughs> um, my name is Nada Zohdi. I'm a student here at the Kennedy School and also editor-in-chief of the Harvard Journal of Middle East Policy. Um, and in your speech, you mentioned the critical role that Tunisia's civil society has played in the democratic transition um, so my question is, could you share with us maybe one example of a time when you uh, or your ministers, your government, reached out to civil society to consult them uh, if you were taking a particular decision or developing a certain policy? Could you give us an example of that collaboration? So wh when, we, when we speak about uh, civil society, among them you have the union, you have uh, the boss organization, uh, you have the lawyers, you have... Uh, and uh, during, uh, during our exercise, we, were, uh, we have a daily contact with them uh, on all the problems. And uh, even for economy, when, uh, when, uh, when we started uh, the reforms, when we wanted to start the reforms, we started by organizing uh, uh, and, and, and 
débat, enfin comment on appelle ça, le dialogue national, a, a, a national dialogue about the economy, and we make even the civil society participation to that. We listened to them, we knew all their position, all their proposal, then we took our decision. Of course, and when you take a decision, enfin, a decision you will not make everyone agree. It's against the, t the decision, but it, more, it was important to listen to all the people, and they inspired us in our decision, but it was really a daily work with them. Uh, be because it's the interest as well. If you want to push in one direction, it's better to have uh, these people with you to convince them between the starting than after to get them in the resistance. Lady Joanne, thank you so very much. Thank you. Let us hope your startup democracy becomes a very powerful, uh, 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 long-term major company, as it were. So congratulations to you. Thank you very much for being here. Have a safe evening. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Alex, would you like to?